welcome back everybody. Welcome. We're now starting uh, our first uh, uh, panel, New Media and Politics, Knowledge, Values and Practices. Each of our speakers is going to uh, talk for 15 minutes and then we'll have time for uh, an open uh, session at the end of questions where I invite the speakers up. Uh, so we're going to start with Bart Cummins from the LSE, the Mediation of Violence and Protests, the UK Student Protests. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I slightly changed my title, but that's, uh, it still covers what I wanted to cover. Um, I won't be talking too much about the internet, unfortunately, uh, although the internet was an important factor in the student protests uh, in terms of mobilization, in terms of sustaining the campaigns, uh, in terms of networking between students, um, linking up uh, university students with college students, for example, the internet also played an important role. But also during the protests themselves, in terms of strategies of activists to avoid uh, being kettled or contained by police, uh, Twitter also played an important role to that extent even that the police started to use Twitter as well to communicate with uh, the protesters. Um, what I would like to focus on uh, is that aspect of civic agency, but asking the question, how far can we stretch civic agency? Um, in a sense, democracy itself, itself it was often the result of uh, political uh, violence. Um, so what about uncivic uh, agency? Um, and the case study uh, will be, as I said before, the UK student protests. Um, in general, of course, within our liberal societies and democracies, uh, political violence is, of course, seen as very much anti-civic behavior, disrespectful towards the civilized uh, rules of engagement set out by the liberal representative democracy. Um, however, despite this negative perception, uh, it is still a tactic frequently used uh, by many activist groups struggling for a given uh, cause. Um, at Sioni, for example, talks about um, the lack of upward channels of communication as one of the uh, reasons for potential of, of, of violence. But violence, political violence in a democracy is especially also a vivid reminder that our democracies are not able to pacify uh, all economic, political, and cultural conflicts and tensions embedded uh, in our uh, societies. Of course, defining uh, Political violence uh, is already a, a very moral and ethical uh, problem uh, and has a lot of implications and you will see in the literature of a wide variety of positions being taken by uh, scholars uh, on that aspect. For example, Keane will say, well, uh, we should limit the concept of political violence to bodily harm uh, and not uh, uh, make it so broad uh, that it uh, also covers, for example, violence against things. Um, uh, property damage, for example. Um, however, uh, <coughs> others uh, will include political violence, uh, both uh, violence against people and as well as violence uh, against uh, things, uh, riots, clashes with police, uh, etc. Uh, also in the political philosophy uh, literature, we will often find definitions that uh, uh, put both uh, together. And then you have also those that stretch political viol uh, violence even further into concepts such as structural violence uh, or uh, symbolic violence, uh, as uh, uh, pointed out by Bourdieu. Uh, now, I, while I accept Keane's argument that we should not fall into the trap of repeating uh, the liberal anthem equating violence against people with violence against things, uh, at the same time, violence against things remains uh, violence, and if we look certainly at the legal uh, perspective uh, in the UK, for example, violent disorder uh, refers to both uh, violent acts against people as well as things. Um, the arguments to remove violence uh, from uh, property damage or, or from the tactics of damage uh, is also to some extent a little bit flawed because if you have tax, if you apply tactics of damage, inevitably, uh, usually you get into violent confrontations uh, with the police and, and state security uh, forces. However, uh, we should still make a distinction, I, I would argue, between violence against people and violence uh, against or aiming to damage uh, property. Um, and maybe Hendrik's concept of democratic violence uh, is maybe. Uh, 
useful here uh, because the question then becomes can certain uh, violent tactics uh, such as property destruction for example which in turn runs the risk of uh, violent clashes with agents of the state be seen ever to be seen as a legitimate form of resistance and direct action in a democracy or not. Um, in many ways, there is no good answer to this question. Inevitably, political violence conflicts with some of the basic values and uh, rules of a democracy, but so does economic power uh, and, and economic violence, in a sense. Ted Hendrik uh, proposes five criteria to legitimate certain forms of violence within a democracy. Um, it needs to serve ends that are integral uh, to democracy, uh, freedom, equality, uh, aiming to achieve that. Uh, it should focus on coercive persuas persuasion rather than uh, uh, coercive uh, force, which means that, for example, uh, the uh, suffragettes as such or the uh, Black Panther movement in the US as such did not force the US government or the UK government uh, to act or change their policies, but they certainly play the role in terms of persuading them. Uh, they should be uh, attempts to secure an equality of influence. Uh, so it, according to Hendrik, it should be from a, dis, uh, from, from a position of subordinance. Uh, it should not aim to abolish democracy, so it shouldn't be anti-democratic, uh, but rather have the goal of improving uh, demo democracy and the democratic uh, system. Some examples of this, uh, for example, like occupations of factories and university, not that violent, but violent disruptions of meeting of international organizations, targeted attacks on banks, uh, certain shops or fast food restaurants, uh, or hacking a company's or a government's websites to expose uh, certain injustices. In a sense, this is insurrectionary symbolic violence by the subordinate. Uh, in a sense, the antithesis of Bourdieu's symbolic violence. Uh, so, aiming to bring the illegitimacy of the private to public attention and create public debate, as Gwen uh, Williams uh, outlines. And the symbolic nature lies in the fact that these acts are hardly designed to genuinely deterioralize uh, the dominant system that is being attacked. Uh, they are often very targeted, cosmetic, co it's cosmetic violence often, uh, nor does it uh, provide a, a convincing impetus for uh, systematic change, as, it, as they are also isolated events often. And of course, the mediation of these events also becomes of crucial importance. Um, public opinion towards political violence is, of course, highly unfavorable. Uh, in a study uh, a few years ago, even before 9-11, Van Alst and Walgrave pointed out that only one or two percent of uh, the Belgian and French population approved of tactics of causing damage to property, uh, while these countries do have, comparatively speaking, a tradition of uh, more militant uh, uh, action and, and certainly when it comes to strikes, uh, etc., and demonstrations. Of course, uh, there's a long history that shows that uh, there's a bias against social movements and, and, and certainly when it concerns uh, violence. However, uh, as we've shown in, in our research and, and others as well, it, the media cannot be approached as a monolithical, uh, negatively biased uh, actor. Uh, there are uh, varieties, uh, uh, variations there. Uh, also, activists have become much more media savvy in managing the media, uh, in terms of counter-spinning, uh, for example. Um, and they are also more and more aware that uh, protests only receive validation as social realities through media coverage. Without media presence, these events would be meaningless to some extent. Symbolism of the act requires its mediation. The student protests, there were four demonstrations, and I'm not going to go too much into detail uh, into that. There were two big demonstrations, which were the most violent, the first and the fourth. Um, in, the, in the first, the, the headquarters of the, the Tory uh, or the Conservative Party uh, at Millbank uh, were occupied uh, by about two, 300 students, but 
the courtyard had about 2,000 students I would, or, or protesters. Um, so there were also some staff there. Um, uh, then there was a smaller demonstration. Again, a small, uh, each of these demonstrations also uh, adapted to the tactics of the police uh, and to avoid uh, being kettled. Half of the demonstrations got uh, kettled for several hours uh, contained uh, in, a, in a certain area uh, by the police. Uh, and obviously the second demonstration learns from these experiences and, and starts adapting uh, and, and using different uh, tactics. Uh, especially the fourth one was very uh, uh, violent, uh, where uh, many people occupied Parliament Square while it was cordoned off. Um, but also uh, Winston Churchill's uh, statute was defaced uh, the Christmas tree do donated by Norway was put on fire on Trafalgar Square. Uh, uh, and also shops uh, in Oxford Street were attacked. And worst of all, uh, the royal couple, uh, uh, Rolls-Royce, was uh, vandalized uh, in uh, our street, Regent's uh, Street. What I wanted to do uh, is, uh, what, I, what I did was a content analysis, uh, and I just finished it last week, so I'll just give you a, a little taste of, of, of the results. Uh, I analyzed 334 articles, editorial and commentary pieces of these four uh, publications, Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph being right-wing, uh, The Guardian uh, and, the, and The Independent being more uh, left-wing. Um, here we see the uh, red at the top is uh, articles that have as main focus uh, of the article the violence uh, by protesters. Um, the green one are the issues that the students actually want to address, tuition fees, uh, education, uh, and this is the political process, uh, the conflicts uh, in terms of uh, the Liberal Democrats being caught uh, uh, in between uh, their pledges and being in government. Uh, and as you see, the, the proportion of the political process, certainly here, where the votes uh, took place, uh, the political process started to get a lot of attention. But what's also uh, important here is that the proportion of attention um, for the issues uh, doesn't particularly, uh, is, isn't, isn't affected by, by the violence which uh, occurred here and occurred a, a little bit, but, but what is sure is that violence does secure you an exponentially uh, more exposure uh, because the events uh, which were less violent uh, got much less uh, attention. Uh, in the second period part of uh, the analysis, we also see that the attention shifts towards police uh, and, and, and police violence and their tactics. why I gave it a pink color, but anyway. Um, another, uh, these were the sources being used by the different publications. Um, and if uh, we compare that distribution across different types of sources per publication, for example, uh, whereas 30% uh, of total number of sources used were politicians in the in the independent, for example, it was 37% of uh, politicians. Other variations on, 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 on uh, anomalies uh, include a disproportional amount of attention for police and official spokespersons uh, in the Daily Telegraph compared to other uh, newspapers, which is not very surprising. Uh, the right-wing uh, media also uses much more uh, witnesses uh, to describe events than the left-wing uh, media does. They give more uh, voice to the protesters. Um, and finally, uh, militant voices are always given more prominence than moderate student protesters in all newspapers, and this is especially the case in The Guardian, where 35% of sources uh, were militant uh, students. Um, of course, the context in which these sources uh, are used uh, are, of, are, are different from one uh, newspaper to the other, so the framing of it. Uh, 